What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Monster Review where we take a look at tech, tech tips and how-to videos. Today, I got a how-to video for you. But first, let's do a little history. The first iPod was released on October 23rd, 2001 by Steve Jobs himself. It came in two capacities, a 5 and 10 gigabyte version. It had a battery life of 10 hours, a mechanical wheel, and a 2 inch monochrome backlit LCD display. In 2004, the iPod had dominated the personal music player segment, becoming the new digital Walkman of the new millennium. Many companies tried to get a slice of that apple pie, but unfortunately, the iPod was more than just a product. It was a brand, a fashion statement. I was a teenager back then and I remember exactly what the iPod represented. Only the cool rich kids had one. If you had anything else like a Santa Sansa, you were considered poor and uncool. At least with the kids I grew up with. Unfortunately, back in high school, I was just a poor kid with a yearly allowance of 120 bucks. At that point in time, the iPod 5th generation video is what all the cool cats had. And for us kids back then, our players were a big part of our life. They were right up there with our flip phones in terms of devices we couldn't live without. For me, instead of investing my life savings into an iPod, I decided to go with something more familiar. I decided to go with the Sony MP3 CD player. Later on in 2008, after high school and while I was working in the college, I decided to splurge on an iPod. Soon after I bought the iPod, everybody moved on to the iPhone and it became the ultimate iPod slash phone. At the time, the iPhone was exclusive to AT&T and I was trapped with Magenta. Feeling like a prehistoric caveman, I stuck to my iPod Classic until getting the iPhone 4. Now that's a lot more information than a lot of you cared for, but this iPod here is iconic and it means a lot to my generation. I felt like I had to give it its due respect. Now, although this MP3 player is iconic, it doesn't mean it was indestructible. The classic iPods used a mechanical hard drive. Pair that with any bumps and falls and this would cause the hard drive to fail prematurely. The failure rate for the hard drive was about 20%. This was a huge issue with the iPods. Another common issue were lines forming on your LCD display. Black lines would just show up one day out of the blue on your display. You didn't have to drop it or anything. They just show up. That was one of the main issues I had with my iPod here. And then of course, you might have other issues with the scroll wheel, lock switch, center button, etc. The issues I have with my iPod is the line on the screen, the faceplate is cracked, the hard drive is starting to go bad, and the battery no longer holds its charge. So I purchased a screen, battery, faceplate, and SD adapter to rebuild this iPod and bring it back to perfect health. And with the SD adapter, I can install a solid state memory SD card and bring it into the year 2020. Next year will be the iPod's 20th anniversary and what better way to celebrate than to bring it out of storage and repair it. And depending on how popular this video gets, maybe do a rebuild for a Zoom. Who knows? Although I've heard some horror stories about rebuilding a Zoom, so maybe not. But if you have an iPod that means a lot to you and it no longer works and you would like to bring it back from the dead, then this video is for you. If you don't have an iPod and would like one, it might be cheaper to just buy a working one off of eBay. With all the parts from my iPod, it came up to a little over 70 bucks. That's a lot to spend on an old piece of tech, especially seeing that you can get a working iPod anywhere between 100 to 150 bucks. But enough chit chat. Let's get to work. So the first thing you want to do before even starting is to back up your music. If you can do that, that is. If your hard drive still works and you're able to back up your data, then be sure to back up all your photos, videos, and music. If you don't have anything worth backing up or your hard drive is completely dead, then you can go ahead and skip this step. If on a Mac, use a program called Houdini to unhide all the music files on your iPod in the music folder that is located in the iPod underscore controls folder. On a PC, just select show hidden files and folders in your folder option. Yes, by default, Apple hides all of your music transferred to your iPod through iTunes. Once they are unhidden, you can copy all the music to a backup drive. Don't worry if all your songs have a four letter name like I, N, N, A, etc. Once imported into iTunes or whatever music software you use, the actual name of the song should show up. You'll get one or two that don't, but you can just update the title. Now with that, we can bring out the tools. 
Here's the iPod we'll be working on. As you can see, it's in pretty bad condition. Face plate's all scratched up um, and the screen has a line on it. There's also some scratches on the side and the back of the iPod. First thing we're gonna do is gently pry the face plate off of the back housing. Open it very gently because you don't wanna rip any cables. Get yourself a tweezer and remove the cable for the headphone jack. I believe there is a tab on this so make sure you deactivate the tab first. Now we're going to remove the cable for the hard drive. Put that aside. Here is the old mechanical hard drive. It was made by Toshiba. Now we're going to flip the tab and remove the cable for the battery. Put that aside. Now we're going to remove the screws holding down the faceplate to the motherboard and screen housing. After removing the screws, the faceplate is still being held by tab, so gently prying it to... Oh. Uh, please do as I say and not as I do. Alright, we're about halfway there. So now what I want to do is I want to make sure that the replacement screen I ordered is exactly like the OEM screen. So just compare the ribbon cable and the size and so on. After verifying it's the same, go ahead and remove the cable for the screen. There's no tabs holding it down. And it should just come right off, just like that. So we're going to go ahead and get our new screen and we're going to place it correctly and guide the cable into the connector and then use a tweezer to uh, push in the connector all the way. Next remove the protective covering on the faceplate and the screen itself and then just put the faceplate on but don't forget the center button. I think you need that. Once everything is fitted correctly, then go ahead and apply a little bit of pressure to get the tabs to lock into place. Now warning, if your center button falls off, please make sure you put it in correctly because there's only one way it goes in. And if you don't put it in correctly, you're going to have problems pressing that center button. And I'm just testing to make sure all the buttons are clickable. So now we can work on the battery on the back cover. First we gotta remove it, so get yourself a pick and just gently pry the battery upwards and it should come off. You will leave some glue left behind on the cover, so make sure you get yourself some alcohol and a wipe and clean that off. If it doesn't come off, get a scraper and uh, scrape off as much glue as you can and then you can rub it down with um, an alcohol pad again. Now get your new battery and just uh, put it in the same place the old battery was in. And just apply a little bit of pressure so the glue can take hold. Put that aside and now we can work on our SD card adapter. So just put your SD card in it, connect the ribbon cable to the iFlash adapter and then connect the ribbon cable to the connector on the motherboard of the iPod. So go ahead and grab your back cover. Just make sure it's in place correctly. And we're gonna first install the battery cable and then the headphone jack cable. Don't forget to engage the clips. Now before closing up the iPod, don't forget these rubber bumpers. I had to go back and reinstall them. If you don't know where they go, here's a picture to help you. Okay, so what have I learned? Well, the rebuild was surprisingly easy, and I guess that's what happens when you rebuild a piece of tech that's a little over 10 years old. Back then, DIY tech repairs were simple. That's just not the case these days. The iFlash adapter is pretty straightforward. However, not all SD cards work with it. 
I tried two 32 gigabyte class 10 UHS-1 micro SD cards from SanDisk and Samsung, two regular class 2 and 10 UHS-1 SD cards with 1 gig and 16 gig capacity and none of them worked. When I tried to restore my iPod so it could format the SD card, I get an error message in iTunes. I tried it on a Mac and PC. Mac would give me an error code and Windows would just tell me the drive is currently being used. It wasn't until I tried a 4 gig Toshiba Class 4 UHS-1 SD card that was in my son's Nintendo 2DS did everything work. I eventually ordered a 32 gig Class 10 UHS-1 SanDisk SD card to keep the capacity close to the original hard drive and it works perfectly. You don't have to do what I did, you can get a bigger SD card if you desire. Using the iFlash with the SD card makes the iPod both lighter and quicker. I don't think this iPod has ever worked so fast. There is no lag whatsoever. I love it. And the weight difference is crazy. This iPod feels fake how light it is. The mechanical hard drive isn't that heavy, but switching over to an SD card really sheds some weight. And the new battery brings back the portability of this iPod. The original battery has been shot for years, and it's my fault. I used to leave my iPod in a charging dock for a long period of time, so I would get about 2 hours of use before it would die. But in its prime, Apple claimed this iPod could get 14 hours of music on a single charge. Of course, it's been so long I don't remember the exact battery life numbers, but with the replacement battery after cycling the battery, I got 12.5 hours of life listening to a One Republic track on repeat. It's not bad, but I mean, it's a little disappointing. I figured battery life would be better now that we were using a flash card, but there's a lot to consider. The replacement screen is an OEM, so it could possibly require more power than the OEM screen, or the battery could just be a cheap knockoff. But 12.5 hours is still pretty good. Nothing too special about the screen. It did get rid of the annoying line, and the display looks good. Definitely on par with the OEM. My biggest regret was purchasing this cheap black faceplate. After installing it, I noticed small cracks in the paint. After polishing the stainless steel on the back, I noticed even more cracks. So my theory is that the heat makes the paint for the faceplate crack. It's what happened to the OEM faceplate and I'm guessing it's what's happening to my replacement. Had I known this, I would have looked for a clear faceplate. But you live and you learn. Anyway, that does it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, be sure to give me thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down work also. Be sure to subscribe if you like videos like these. If you've subscribed to this channel already, a big thank you to you. If you just subscribed, welcome. And I hope to live up to your expectations. With that, I bid you farewell. Thanks for watching. See ya.